thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you very much for having me this afternoon. I will quickly go with you through a number of uh, introductory slides before then going a bit more into detail uh, into one of the projects that I'm currently involved in and always asking the question whether science and policy and land management can really come together and how we can accomplish that because I think that many of you, I've also heard about your research in part at least, um, that you're also yeah, interested in these issues and uh, yeah, but I guess it's a common challenge for all of us to figure out how we can make these networks and the interface between science policy and management actually work. So I will quickly go through the content of my talk just as a, an add-on to the introduction I will briefly tell you a bit about where I'm coming from and how I actually got interested in sustainability issues. Then I will talk a bit about the development of the concept of sustainability institutions and ideas that have developed over time. And then look at human nature relationships, which are well, a very complex issue as you can easily imagine, where basically all the way from philosophical views on the world and, and world views that might come from spiritual, religious backgrounds, all the way to natural sciences coming through um, economics, through social sciences, and so it's really interdisciplinary. Then biological diversity and ecosystem services have been the topics that have kept me quite busy for the past more than 10 years by now, and uh, yeah, so I will go into that a bit and briefly touch on our ways of actually trying to find out what is true in this world uh, when we come from a scientific background. And then we'll talk about issues that we're probably also well aware of that we have always when we talk about these issues, how to manage land, there are trade-offs that we are faced with, and how to deal with those. And then we'll have a brief um, talk about okay, one, one particular project that I'm currently involved in and, and with you as well. So without further hesitation, we jump to Germany just to let you know where I'm from and that little dot you can hardly see it, I'm afraid. Because this there in northern Germany, that's where I'm from. And uh, as a boy, I walked around the green areas around my, my parents' house and got interested in birds. They were just there, and so I started watching them and uh, so got interested in natural history. But I also noticed that there were types of land use going on also in my area that seemed quite destructive and seemed to also bring problems for um, those birds that I was mostly interested in. Um, it's hard to see here this photo on the left is uh, actually peat extraction, peat for horticulture, and uh, then also in terms of agriculture and expansion of urban areas, that is also land use change that is ongoing in many areas across Germany. And then the second little dot that just showed up timidly here in the middle, that's where Philips University is based, that's where the small town of Mabo is located, about 100 kilometers north of Frankfurt, and uh, with similar issues. So we have land use change affecting habitats and affecting the species that live in these habitats. And so much of the work on biodiversity obviously tries to figure out how we can organize land use land management in such a way that we can maintain our biodiversity. Briefly going into the history of the concept of um, sustainability, we can look at a number of milestone publications. You probably have heard of the book Silent Spring in 1962 by Rachel Carson that alerted people to the problems that arise from um, heavy chemical inputs in intensive agriculture. Then there was, 10 years later, the report on limits to growth, the report of the Club of Rome, where a group of people had actually tried to model the world, what's actually called the world model, the model that they developed, looking at resource availability and resource consumption rates, and trying to extrapolate into the future what might be the big challenges coming up. And then in 1992, you probably also know about the UN Convention on Biological Diversity that, that was founded back then. And then um, yet again, a number of years later, in 2005, the reports of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment were published. And those are also one of the milestones that many people refer to when they talk about sustainability these days. Then, as a still fairly newcomer to the uh, group of, of institutions that deal with these issues, biodiversity and ecosystem services, we have for the past four years now had a structure called IPBES, which stands for the Intergovernmental 
platform like biodiversity and ecosystem services, another UN body that uh, you probably also um, know about the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the IPBS is basically the IPCC for the biodiversity and service community. And that for a German talking about sustainability, it's very important to always bring up this group. Uh, he is um, Karl von Karlowitz, and he, in 1713, a year before he passed away, uh, published a book on, uh, the, on, on forestry, basically, and uh, putting forward the idea that it would be useful to uh, replant one tree for every tree that you extract from the forest to maintain the forest per se over long time periods, and that was by no means a, a given thing at that time in Germany. There was Wood was the main source for construction, also for fuel, and so deforestation had progressed very quickly with the beginning industrial development. And uh, so he's sometimes quoted as the, the father of sustainability uh, ideas in Germany. But I think that, well, he probably has had many predecessors that just didn't publish books. And yeah, finally, we have uh, since this, uh, September last year, the uh, United Nations General Assembly passed the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and so that's where we are now. Everybody says, yes, we want to be sustainable, and uh, the only problem now is to figure out how can we do that. And the problem or the issue that we're faced with when we are based in central Germany is a landscape like this, where you have settlements and agricultural areas in between, more settlements over there, you have a bit of topography, we higher areas are forested, uh, down in the valleys it's mostly agricultural land use, about 50% agriculture, about 30% forest, um, somewhere around 5 to 7%, depending on the region, it can also be a lot more of urban areas, so those, those are the landscapes that we look at, and there we now have to, if we come from a science perspective, start and try to bring together our theories, our theoretical assumptions about how these systems work, and uh, then usually have this conglomerate of, yes, we have an ecological system indicated here by this green thing, and then inside we have social systems and economic systems, and they all somehow interact. And that leaves us with complex system dynamics, which are always pesky to deal with because of all the issues that complexity brings with it, lack of predictability, and sometimes chaotic behavior, all these issues. And in practice, if we want to study these systems, what we need is data. And data is what is always difficult to get your hands on, on sorry, um, if you look at these landscapes, because there are so many variables that we should be interested in, and normally not enough um, people around to actually collect these data and would then share them for everybody to use. And then we not only have to talk about the science side, collecting data, analyzing them, but also about the, the human dimension of human behavior, human choices that we make, because that is in the end what really drives these systems to a large degree. Zooming in a bit um, further, we can then see that here again the, the big thing on the outside is the ecological system in which everything that we do as humans is embedded. And uh, you see here these arrows indicating some kind of cycles where we have flows of energy, cycles of matter, and then social systems and economic systems working within these, extracting food feed fuel from natural sources and um, emitting emissions waste um, and using ecosystems as sinks for whatever we emit and throw away. And so that system we want to function quite nicely. And one and in order to study these systems in a more coherent way, different institutions have developed different conceptual frameworks looking at basic structures. And one thing up here in uh, DPSIR, I don't know whether you've heard that acronym before, um, but I will quickly go through it. It starts with D for drivers, where we have ideas about what drives these systems. That is usually large-scale, long-term developments and trends like climate change and technological development, um, demographic change, macroeconomic change, and policy development as the main issues, and they have an impact on landscapes on, that are then characterized here by these variables, vegetation, soils, topography, all these things, and then um, if we try to figure out how they might, how these systems might develop, we start talking about 
scenarios up here it appears and we will talk a bit more about that as we go through the talk and uh, so trying to extrapolate and using these usually as constants we don't usually assume that much will change in terms of geology over time periods of a few decades or so what we usually look at in these scenarios but uh, then other variables that are more dynamic change more quickly and where in many cases we either have monitoring networks like for weather data to climate variables or we can use remote sensing and so get data from large areas in a short period of time soils are always an issue that is particularly difficult because you have to really look into the soil that's little that you can get through remote sensing and so that's one of the tough jobs these um, drivers through filter through the landscape then create what is known as pressures in the EPSI hard scheme uh, here represented by land use types and land use intensity and there again we have different issues with data availability and those then change the state of the variables that affect us more directly where we have physical, chemical and biological variables uh, oh, sorry. And those then determine impacts, and these impacts are, in the case of our scheme, what really is felt by us as individuals or as society as a whole. And that can, in an agricultural context, or also forestry context, or also fisheries, obviously, in all the primary sectors of the economy, we have yields, yield potential. Then we also are interested in regulatory processes, climate regulation, um, soil fertility, things like those, and also cultural aspects that we receive and then there we have trade synergies depending on which way particular variables are affected and the impacts that we feel then induce responses or not <laughs> and uh, the responses are what we then have as policy decisions or management decisions that we do um, either on a daily basis if it's management activities or we as consumers going shopping the decisions that we make there also play a role in this whole picture and that in the end whatever we do here be it consciously as a planned activity like policy development or particular land management schemes or just as we go along without being thinking about it has an impact again on the drivers and that's where the loop then closes so that's the DPSIR scheme in short it's just one more scheme that is also not as commonly used I think in applied context because it's more a scientific more cerebral kind of um, removed from reality almost kind of approach uh, but uh, the Resilience Alliance is a group mostly of ecologists um, named by Colleen and Anderson people from the US are affiliated with it but also people from other disciplines uh, thinking about resilience thinking about how systems after they've been disturbed might bounce back might, might get back to the original state or develop to something different and um, they have come up with this funny scheme looks like infinite sign the line number eight and uh, they say that from from their studies of ecosystems starting off there but also looking at economic and um, social systems that they were able to identify this um, almost well, not regular pattern but um, a certain trend towards the systems going through four distinct phases um, they might be a very different length so there's there's no no regularity in here but uh, just the idea that systems when they start off here um, from a um, pretty low potential and low connectedness kind of maybe after a volcanic rupture or something you have a barren landscape and from there new species have to come in and colonize that would be a situation in ecological systems where you can then start with our strategists ecology you have the, the art strategist like short lifetime hyperproductive space that is what you get here and then as you go along going to more complex systems with more long lived organisms um, slow reproduction you get to the K, the more stable state and then they say actually this does not last forever usually it somehow um, tends to then go through destruction collapse uh, but only to reorganize and then go back into the loop um, and so that's, that's their basic idea and some people have tried to apply this to um, actual analysis of social, social and ecological systems and try to figure out whether this can be used also in applied contexts the third and last 
a conceptual framework for social social ecological systems that I want to bring up here is one that is related to the development of the platform and biodiversity and ecosystem services. They only last year uh, published their conceptual framework that a lot of people, I think that paper has some 50 authors or more, um, try to come up with, uh, again, looking at elements of social systems, economic systems, ecosystems, how they're interconnected, and what you see here in different colors, some things are in blue, some things are in green, and the rest is in black. Um, that is meant to show that there are indeed different worldviews among the people who have been involved in developing this. Um, and some say, well, good quality of life, this stuff in black is what everybody more or less could agree to. But um, you let me hear, um, this is the uh, and ecosystem built and services and biodiversity systems. That is more kind of the sciencey approach to understanding these systems, whereas the bloom with Mother Earth systems of life down here, nature's gifts and living in harmony with nature. That's the slogan that the Japanese went for when they were in charge of the CBD conference in 2010, showing a maybe more spiritual, more emotional approach to the world. And uh, yeah, the people who drew up this scheme felt that it was very important to have all these different approaches to understanding the systems we live in in there. So that's um, just quickly for these conceptual frameworks and then as we go along have now different conceptual frameworks that we can work with um, trying to analyze the systems that we're interested in and then trying to understand it and eventually hopefully maybe even predict or at least roughly project system behavior into the future what you need is models and uh, models being as a term per se very broad concept. Anything that stands for something else that is usually either bigger or more complex or both uh, is a model. Um, but here we look at, in the end, numerical models, computer based models, simulation models, and as we do that, as we try to come up with computer code that mimics some of the processes that we're interested in, we immediately again get into the trade off issue and in uh, modeling to have the general trade-off between either having very realistic models that try to model every little element of the system that you work with, uh, but if you do that, you have runtime problems, even the most powerful computers still struggle, well, the climate models now have their, their models using in shape, that uh, they, can, well, they still sometimes have to wait for months before their, their run is over and they, they get new results, but if you go to even higher complexity and try to also include biodiversity issues, social systems, economic systems, then you very quickly reach a state where even the most powerful computers are not able to handle that. And so that's one thing. And that complexity is nice if you can say, yes, my model is very close to nature, very close to reality, but um, whatever happens in all these complex elements and subroutines that you might have in your model, you lose traceability in the end can have results from your model that you yourself can't explain, don't understand. And uh, so that's and lots of more issues um, that are that more, more technical issues. And um, then if you, well, but this hasn't stopped people. People have tried to develop models that uh, try to depict our world as it is. I guess the, the oldest, first real computer-based model was the one that was part of the analysis for the Club of Rome report, the Limits to Growth report in 1972. And uh, assessment models um, that try to look at different issues, ecological issues, social issues, economic issues, simultaneously are usually called integrated assessment models or IKMs. And uh, then we also, especially in the context of biodiversity system services, are often interested in land use or land use change. And models for that are again a category um, of its own. And uh, then we often also are interested in more detail in particular processes, be it carbon accumulation in soils, be it um, nutrient turnover in a lake, things like that, or growth of a forest, or predator prey dynamics important for biocontrol in agricultural systems. There we have lots and lots of different models for different case studies that look at these issues on a process base, um, trying to really emulate what is what the 
researcher believes this happened. But yeah, again, there's a lot. And just one, one word of a warning about all these models that um, even from the science community, there's right, scientists always criticize what other scientists do. Uh, sometimes they even criticize their own work. <laughs> but, um, with these complex models, um, there, there has been this criticism that it is a dangerous thing to use them in policy contexts and land management contexts because it might be overinterpreted or misinterpreted by people who maybe are not really familiar with the details of the modeling technique and might take whatever comes out of the model as a better prediction of what will probably happen. If you listen to the more careful and cautious modelists, they will always say, well, this is this scenario-based extrapolation, so it is something that, based on my assumptions and based on my model, is not entirely unlikely to happen in the future, but is not a prediction. Um, but there's a whole gradient that it can get quite quite murky in between. Um, that I guess we, coming from a science perspective, have one one of our challenges here that even if we do develop very good models and are quite confident that what they produce as output does tell us something useful in communication with stakeholders, with people who might use the information in policy making or land management is always a, an issue where we have to be very, very careful about what we say. And scenarios we briefly mentioned already um, are, well, scenarios are is another of these terms like function or model that it, it can have very many different meanings depending on the person who's using it in particular context. But in our context here, when we look at these complex systems and the way that they might behave, um, a scenario is a, a description of what might happen based on the assumptions that we have to make here at the outset. And there is again a gradient from uh, more narrative scenarios or verbal descriptions of the systems that we're interested in, all the way towards quantitative scenarios that are then directly linked to models where you have some physical unit at the end and, and some output related to that. And um, those fall all under this general um, scheme of scenarios, but models often overlap quite much with scenarios. But um, yeah, scenarios can work without models or without numerical models. And then down here there are um, depictions for two different types of scenarios. One is the normative scenario approach, where as the scenario developer, you come up with an idea of what you want the world to be like, what you want your system to behave like. And then have that, and then what you do in the subsequent analysis process is look at different options for achieving this target. And uh, so that's known as a normative scenario, and exploratory scenarios are different in the sense that you don't really have strong opinions on where you want to go, but you just say, well, I could imagine this or that could happen. Politicians could say, yes, we want to, like in the IG targets of the CBD, where they want 17% um, of terrestrial areas in every country of the world as priority areas for conservation, say, we, we assume that is done, it could be done in different ways, and so then we start looking at what our system does, and that would be the exploratory scenario. Now we're jumping to the two other important terms in our context, biodiversity and ecosystem services. And uh, up here I put in that these are two very tricky concepts and you may be very well aware of all the pitfalls involved in this um, because biodiversity in itself is very complex and depending on the source that you look at you might find slightly different definitions. And uh, so looking at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity and how they define what biological then they basically say, well, it's gene species and ecosystems, um, which, well, if you come from, from a more um, uh, a science side where we might want to distinguish even more, we could say, well, this is the, the subspecific level where we start from molecular diversity, um, going through um, then possibly even subspecies and, and forms and varieties, going to species, and in the end is one of the basic units in our taxonomy and the systematics, 
and then going on from there, obviously not directly to each system, but biologists would then start talking about populations, would start talking about communities, and all that is basically in there, and that just has been condensed to these three terms in the context of the convention. And quantifying biodiversity is, um, again, a, another thing where you have to decide at the outset how you want to do it. You can either simply count different entities that are there, and that could be species, could be systems, or land use types, something like that. And you could simply say, well, I choose an area on the surface of the globe and say, I just go and count how many species there are, how many different systems, and use that. And then other um, approaches have used also the relative abundance of different species, for example, where you then um, go into biodiversity indices that uh, can convey more information about how evenly this diversity is spread over the different elements that are part of the community. And uh, then we have the different approaches depending on whether we look at only one area, either rather small scale, then we talk about alpha diversity, and if it's a landscape or region, then we can talk about gamma diversity, but uh, that's where we can then use either uh, the simple counting approach or the index approach and have that, and better diversity is not as well known yet, but it's gaining more momentum in scientific analysis because it's very important also in the context of, for example, protected area designs, um, areas like those, where it's the difference between two areas that are then compared for their species composition, for example, and the degree of similarity or dissimilarity is what you then capture as better diversity. And the fundamental hypothesis that is underlying all the debates about um, biodiversity and species system functioning is that yes, there is a link, a functional link between how many species there are, how evenly they may be spread through the communities, that that means something for issues like ecosystem system stability, productivity, these issues. Jumping to ecosystem system services, that is a term that developed a bit later than um, the biodiversity as a term. Biodiversity was coined in the 1980s, early 1980s. But the basic idea must have been around for longer, just nobody had used the term before. And ecosystem services um, also date back to the 1980s, but they really took off during the 1990s. And they're because of the long history, so a long history, but um, a few decades now that the term has been around, and different people again have come up with different schemes for classifying and describing and naming different ecosystem services. And well, the basic idea is that something is happening in environment that is somehow good for us. And that's where um, the term service then was taken from and another term that was used uh, by IP Desna in this conceptual framework is mentioned benefits to people um, that goods and services derived from ecosystems or nature's gift if we take this more holistic view of uh, well humans being part of the system where well, the other part of the system gives us nice things that we need to live. And it's always linked to a human perspective. So there's some debate, some theoretical debate over whether ecosystem services exist if there are no humans. And um, I guess the general answer is probably not, because really um, it takes the human being benefit from whatever goes on in these systems for ecosystem services as a concept to make sense. And so we need to somehow develop ideas of how valuable system services are to us, how we want to quantify that, and um, so the difficult issue of, of value is involved there. And monetary value is the thing that our economic system happily works with and well, on the whole works quite well, but there's lots of debate over whether monetization is the appropriate thing to do uh, for certain system services. Then there's another complication that people have also started talking about the system disservice, that there are also things happening in ecosystems in our environment that are maybe not so nice for us, and I will get back to that in a moment. But again, uh, our fundamental assumption is that ecosystem services are directly linked to ecosystem functions, which are linked to biodiversity, and so you have this cascade of uh, effects there that you all want to study. And this is just a um, visualization of the um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment approach to um, categorizing different ecosystem services. We have regulated ecosystem services spread to climate, technology, pest control, pollination, 
such things than what is well, usually most recognizable to everybody are the provisioning services because that's what we eat every day, that's what we close ourselves in, that's uh, the stuff with which we build our houses, and so whatever we take in terms of food, feeds, water, and the raw materials, that is now called provisioning ecosystem services. And cultural ecosystem services are um, a category that's always more tricky when it comes to validation because there it depends very much on perception and it's, it's not as straightforward there are no, no easy technical devices with which you could go and measure how aesthetic the landscape is because it will always depends on it's in the eye of the beholder whether you think it's, it's beautiful or just boring or something else and uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment also coined the term supporting ecosystem service for basically lumping everything together that they couldn't quite fit in the other three categories, which is things like primary productivity, which is soil fertility, which is like those that they say sustain and support all the other ecosystem services. But uh, it's quite noticeable that that has been a very difficult category to work with. Um, and uh, there is another initiative, the CISIS, the Plus, no, we always forget what it stands for, but it's an international classification approach that has been pushed forward um, very much by European institutions, where they basically lump regulating services and supporting new system services together and call them now maintenance and regulation um, new system services. And now, just very quickly, um, you all know about these things very well. So, um, if we perceive the world around us and um, start thinking about what is going on there and what we, we believe to be true about the functioning of these systems. What we all do is we work based on our own experience and um, as a community, as a society, we usually also have traditions that mostly have developed through the experience. And that is how we do things, that's how we deal with, with, for example, how we do agriculture, how we manage forests, how we go fishing, things like those. And uh, so that is usually the, the tried and true approach. But, well, sometimes we question whether it is sustainable, what we are doing. And uh, so there are, are doubts sometimes related to this. But this is what is, especially now, also in the context of this IPS work, in the government platform, where there is the ecosystem services, the term indigenous and local knowledge. And that also, for political reasons, is a very important aspect. And if we do our usual scientific approach, we go through, well, we have an idea, we wonder why something is the way we perceive it, and then come up with a hypothesis, and then go through all the usual steps of coming up with a, a concept of how to study the system, collect data, do statistical analysis, find that it all doesn't make sense, and have to go back and redo it all over again. And if we do it often enough, and, and then at some point uh, really come up with, with we, we find our assumptions um, verified over and over again, then we call it a theory and start working with it. Um, being success to be successful with this approach, obviously, we need um, to satisfy certain requirements of statistical design, statistical analysis, and the, the key ones are usually that whatever we study, the units that we study have to be independent, they must not be statistically related. And we also need replication. And if we start working with fairly large systems, um, those are two things that become practically impossible very quickly. Because we cannot do experiments on very large scales. But we do in a way, but um, it's not quite the way that we should do experiments. And um, the one thing that in any case cannot escape from is replication, we can't do anymore. And so we often, and if we look at the global scale, we always work with n equals one, and then we, we cannot use our, our normal approach. But still, we want to say something about the system, but we should manage it. And so that's the general challenge that we work with. What we also realize now that we started studying ecosystem services is that um, there are trade offs between ecosystem services, even if we look only at two. And uh, well, we will be lucky that we have co-variation um, along a particular gradient. This year is meant to be intensity of land use that uh, maybe yields might go up, but um, if we 
in the process of, of doing arable agriculture, add lots of organic amendments, we might be able to maintain or even increase soil carbon, things like that might be possible, but usually it doesn't work like that, especially with soil carbon that we do intensive agriculture, we usually lose it. And so that's where we have trade-offs and where, where many concerns are connected to that about the long-term negative consequences that might come from. And another issue that we find in most cases is that our uh, processes that we look at are not linear but non-linear, at least at some point there tend to be thresholds where suddenly the, the, the small change in driver might have real dramatic effects um, in the other um, variant. And so that's what we find very difficult. But what is now becoming, um, well, one of the main challenges and, and, and uh, objectives of uh, studies of ecosystem services is how to optimize ecosystem services and not only a single ecosystem service but a whole group of ecosystem services. And that we can do partly if we use scenario based approaches because we can then um, start writing down our assumptions, start arguing over them whether they're better or not, uh, can try to develop models to project what might happen if our assumptions were true and might have trajectories these two, scenario A, scenario B, and then can, when we've had model runs and have some, had some output for what the world will be like in 2050, then then start looking where what will be my soil carbon here, what will it be there, or uh, if we have several system services, we might try to sum up the total system service value, and uh, then decide that maybe scenario B is the one that is more desirable from our perspective. The problem with this approach is we have, in the end, knowledge only about two of theoretically almost infinite number of possible trajectories. And um, that is where uh, more advanced analysis techniques are coming in, optimization techniques, uh, where you need more information, you need very good models in order to be able to do that. But people with some systems, like agricultural systems, for example, in Europe, have started modeling them at this level um, and combining with, with climate change models and, and models for soil processing, for example, and then say that they can basically test not everything that is between um, the, the limits of, of your, your overall trajectory into the future, the range of trajectories, but uh, that then you can find optimum solutions based on these analysis that are not at all easy to handle. Um, what then needs to be known in the end is the real shape of the curves that different ecosystem services here, is two is one ecosystem service here, and one is another one, and they are following certain dynamics along a common driver, and um, then you see that one reaches maximum, then goes down, the other one reaches the saturation point, and then Different areas along your x axis would then have a win win situation, you go into a win lose situation, and then you might even get into a situation where you don't win anything and only lose. So, those are the theoretical possibilities that you might find. And what you then also need, if you have that knowledge, um, you can then start looking into whether what you have as a variable you would consider a disservice, something that you want to bring down, the increased gas emissions. For or if it is this ecosystem service, which I've tried to, to do some, some um, just mind experiments kind of thing, trying to figure out when you go through the lists of ecosystem services that people have defined, um, to see whether um, you could actually always convert an ecosystem service by turning it upside down into a disservice. And it works for most, but in a few cases, I'm not so sure maybe there are actually pure ecosystem disservices sometimes um, that you could also find. But yeah, this basically says a very simple idea that um, if you want to optimize uh, ecosystem services, you can either try to um, keep the level at which an ecosystem service is, but reduce the cost, the input cost that you might have in order to achieve it. For some, we don't really have much input cost. Uh, but for many provisional ecosystem services, we actually do have to invest uh, in order to have ideals. And uh, yeah, the other option is to then actually really invest more and, and, um, yeah, and, and go along here. Uh, 
if not, if we want to optimize, we could either bring down the cost for increase the service, and for this service, we could also bring down the cost for decrease the service. That's basically what this is going to say. That was the quick introduction, and now I have to jump very quickly <laughs> to uh, just a few words about one of the projects that I've been involved in, that actually has been the project that brought me to the Philippines. I'm very grateful for uh, Joseph Zettel in particular. He's the overall coordinator of the project that's been funded by the German Federal Ministry of Accreditation and Research, where we are looking into land use intensity and ways of uh, using lots of engineering techniques to make it more sustainable. And yeah, the usual story, there's increasing, usually increasing demand, and uh, that there are trade-offs if we try to maintain or even increase yields. And the project, the Gato project is only one in a group of uh, 12 regional projects in total that are being funded. Uh, some of them actually in Europe, then through Central Asia to Southeast Asia, and Southern Africa and South America. Also some in the Gato is here in Luzon with three areas here in Laguna, then in Nueva Ecija and in Isabel. And then there are also uh, research areas in northern Vietnam and in the Vietnam Delta. And what we would like to do is to find out more about the links between existing functions and existing services in these right groups and landscape, and looking in particular at agricultural yield and uh, the regulated services and cultural services. And that the main challenge that was given to us by the project funder body was that we should, within the five years that we had for the project, should be able to already produce evidence that what we produce as results is being taken up by land managers or policy makers. It's a very high uh, stakes. And yeah, here just very quickly, our design was that in these regions we had um, that five sites where we went for pairs of um, rice paddies. This is from Nueva Ecija, very intensively used rice cropping systems. And try to uh, have one field where we have some structures around it, called it a heterogeneous context. Actually, the people who first went and selected these sites talked about rich and poor structure, but we were then being told that our stakeholders didn't like the terms rich and poor. And so, because obviously it doesn't really relate to anything, any rich or poor. Um, economic um, meaning in that context because it was really about the heterogeneity or homogeneity of the landscape. And what we were interested in in the studies that I've been involved in directly was um, how decomposition works in these paddies and uh, then well one is obviously nutrient cycling but um, then there's also the different organisms that are involved in decomposition. We have the tillivores down here and that are um, a food source for generous predators that later in the season have been shown that they can contribute to biological control in any systems. And the general assumption was, and part of it is, that if we increase land use intensity, we tend to lose biodiversity, and that that should be, in the end, potentially a, a disservice, a, something that is negative for sustainable agriculture in the long term. But, yeah, that, that is the basic question, whether the win-win situation could be reached. So we started off coming from Europe, Central Europe, where there's no rice production at all. We go to Italy, Greece, Spain, yes, there is rice production, but Germany has none. So we came as absolute great horns at first to learn about what is actually happening in these systems. And so we learned that depending on the region, there's very different cropping systems, very different management systems. And uh, then we also have to learn about how the land managers perceive particular groups of species and uh, that yeah, golden apple snail is usually one of the big baddies um, early, like if you're trying to plant young plants or the seed beds that they cause lots of damage there, but later in the season they might actually be seen as hardly beneficial because they might contribute to weed control. Um, so very complex issues and analysts also, um, if they, they had worm casts, we saw some, some seed beds where they were less termination of the rice places um, where we had lots of works and then we did a little bit of experiment there uh, believing that it would possibly turn out that the different regions might have different decomposition rates and that um, the, the land management would differ between the different areas and uh, that there would also be differences depending on whether you have the surface or in the soil and that soil fauna has something to say about how 
quickly this goes. Um, and yeah, add some design point on here, and that's how these fields look like. We put it close to the bunch because we were working at these. And here quickly results. As you see, it was very similar over a period of one year for all the three regions in Luzon. That came as a bit of a surprise. We were expecting to see more differences. But apparently, decomposition um, has gone very similarly in all these regions. Then we did find a slight difference between soil and surface initially, but those disappeared towards so after half a year, those were gone. Um, and what was most interesting for our story that we would like to tell about the role of invertebrates contributing to decomposition is that yes, there is about a 10, 15, sometimes 20 percent um, contribution of invertebrates to decomposition rates, and so that might be potentially interesting in terms of nutrient cycling and um, nutrient availability for the next crop. We also tried to find out a bit more about the actual communities in the paddies, but found that that was extremely challenging, um, that from soil samples it's very hard to extract anything really in the paddies, and with dip nets there, there was a bit more success, but that is than just only the, the surface, and uh, different groups there. Some gradients from the bunks towards the centers of the field that were quite interesting and have been published now, and uh, yeah, so just in a nutshell, those were some of the results, and then we also try to um, well, do what scientists do. We try to get more work out and publish our results. And so we have data and some publications based on that. And then we also try to talk to our partners at Erie and Phil Rice, who actually are involved in extension work and uh, try to get the message out to farmers. But we don't really know yet to what extent the information that we were able to provide has actually been useful. And it's a very fine line, as we mentioned at the beginning. There's, um, if you come with information from scientific studies and say, well, this is the truth, this is how it works, and you should follow my advice based on this, um, that we might be off target. And uh, there are initiatives like this Volcut initiative, where, where people based in Switzerland try to collect um, positive case studies, uh, good examples where things have been tried out in practice and have worked. So more in kind of an experience-based approach. And um, yeah, that's all now coming together um, also in, in this new initiative that is organized through UN bodies and I think that's being one global coordinating body now. And there's actually starting next Monday for the, for the next plenary session for that for the first time this fourth battery of IPVS, there will be the first two assessments that policymakers will actually have to go through and decide whether they want it, whether they want to have it as it is written there. So that it will be a line by line thing with a room of 150, 200, 300 delegates sitting there and quarreling over wording of these um, summaries. But uh, yeah, apart from the grueling um, convention work, uh, there is other ongoing activities under IPBES, and I would like to alert you to it if you're not already aware of it, um, that there are this four regional assessments underway, and one is for Asia Pacific, and uh, that will be going on for the next year or two at least, and uh, that will be open for comments from, from everybody in the end. And uh, so if you're interested in getting involved, that is one possibility, and we're now also trying put together a functioning stakeholder network um, where it's people from large NGOs but also from scientific organizations, quite from indigenous people's groups, uh, trying to come together and, and figure out what IP best assessments could mean to them and how they could contribute to them and how they could eventually hopefully um, get some good information from these assessments for their own work. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm sorry that I almost went a little over time, but yeah, I would be very keen on learning from you whether this means anything to you, whether you are involved in maybe related work, and yeah, maybe if, if there's anybody among you who says, I would be interested in doing work at the Science Policy Interface, I would be interested in getting involved in IGS revenue work or something like that, you can tell me, and so I will then pass that on so that you could be put on an email list and would get information. Thank you very much. I hope everyone would like to be involved in that intergovernmental panel or platform. Platform, yeah. Platform. Yes. Um, the floor is now. Thank you very much.
much, uh, Dr. Stefan. The floor is now open for your comments, uh, questions, or insights regarding his presentation. Anyone would like to ask to shoot the first question?
rice fields, uh, is to plant flowering weeds and other species that can act as, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, it, it, it will tend to host natural enemies of rice beds. Uh, but, well, we tried to implement it, in, in fact, in several stations of field rice, when I was working for field rice, and we have difficulties. Number one, uh, how much of these uh, weeds do we have to plant? Where and when? How long are we going to uh, maintain them in the field? Throughout the year or just during the uh, rice season? Honestly, I didn't get an answer. Could you try to help me? Um, we are struggling with the same question still. And, um, well, according to Iri, we just this morning went over to Iri to, uh, to talk to colleagues there uh, about another ecological engineering experiment that we hope to conduct later this year uh, in a field where they are already doing one of these experiments where they have uh, flowering plants on the buns. And um, I guess there, there's more data accumulating and that will probably start giving a better basis for answering some of the questions about when, where, what, how much of it. Um, but currently, uh, my impression is that there, there is no really good form, no real good foundation for saying quantitatively, this is exactly what you want, would want to go for, but it's still rather vague and really rule of thumb, and more experience-based than, than based on, on good data sets, because the, the database is still fairly limited. And that's the same with every environmental schemes in Europe, where every year millions are funneled into these schemes. And there's been lots of debate over well, is this efficient use of funds? Um, but yeah, it, because of the high variability, so many factors play into the scheme. Um, it's, it's, although the term engineering has been applied, it is diff very different from, from other kinds of engineering where you deal with physical structures build a bridge or a building where there's more experience and more possibility for control whereas in systems where weather can, can change everything in a day um, or population dynamics can go in very unexpected ways it's, it's more dynamic and therefore less predictable and basically you have to admit it's unpredictable and will stay unpredictable and therefore whatever recommendations we do will always have to come based on our current results, based on what our data currently say. But, um, yeah, I guess nobody would dare uh, say that I can guarantee you that if you plant this amount of flowering plant on your plant, you will have this effect on your pest control uh, through parasitoids that might like to come. So it is hard to sell, I think, because you always have to, in the end, say, we have evidence that it can have a beneficial effect, but just how much and when and what is the work this year.